So I'm happy to be introducing um, Dr. Jellison for her talk today. Um, Dr. Jellison is professor of history um, and the department chairperson for history at Ohio University. Among her publications is the book Entitled to Power, Farm Women and Technology, 1913 to 1963, which was published by the University of North Carolina Press. She is currently president of the Agricultural History Society and co-chair of the Rural Women's Studies Association. Uh, her latest research focuses on old order Amish farm women during the Great Depression. And she's going to give us a talk today, A Home on the Range and a Range in the Home, Farm Women's Acquisition of Modern Household Technology. So thank you, Dr. Jelson. Thank you, Dr. Terman. Uh, well, uh, I rushed here, uh, so I'm going to take a, some water. I actually live out in the country and got behind two different school buses this morning, so I was running late. I am going to talk about my book. I noticed Dr. Terman had put up a nice display on the fourth floor with materials uh, for the speaker series, and this book and a nice poster uh, for my book were in that display case as I came rushing through to get to this room. And I wanted to particularly focus, as the title would suggest, on, um, on the Great Plains, the range, and the Midwestern Great Plains states. Most of my quotations that I'll be sharing with you from farm women are from those Great Plains Midwestern states, although uh, many of my statistics I'll be sharing with you are for the Midwest in general. Uh, the Midwest uh, farm belt that existed in the period that the book covers, 1913 to 1963, so it's exclusive of the Midwestern states of Ohio and Michigan, which had uh, become uh, more industrial economies by the time period of my book. Uh, so the four states that I am going to be talking about primarily and sharing women's own words about their experiences being farm women uh, in this 1913 to 1963 period are uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas, the four Midwestern Great Plains states. So one of uh, the quotations I want to share with you, I think, illustrates the thinking behind this ad for a Maytag washing machine in 1935. Farm women are also entitled to power. And that's, of course, where I got the title of my book, Entitled to Power. Why should your husband have a tractor in the field if you don't have a power washing machine for your home. And these are the words I want to share with you here at the beginning of my comments from a Kansas farm woman. Uh, this was in answer to a survey conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture secretary, a man named David Houston, in 1913. And here's what she says about her life as a farm woman in Kansas. Life on the farm is a somewhat one-sided affair. Many times the spare money above living expenses is expended on costly machinery and farm implements to make the farmers work lighter, while little or nothing is done for home improvement and no provision made for the comfort and convenience of the women in the family. And throughout the responses to Secretary Houston's 1913 survey of farm women, and this was women across the then um, 48 states, uh, he found this theme over and over and over again. Farm women felt that their work was undervalued, and one measure of that undervaluing was the lack of investment in equipment that would ease their labor and would deal with their portion of the work in the farm family economy. So these words that I just shared with you of a Kansas farm woman, we could uh, multiply those by thousands and thousands because this was a typical response in 1913 to Secretary Houston's survey. So the, the bottom line here was that women were very critical of the priority given to men's farm equipment which was equipment that was used in the production of cash crops and li large livestock 
over the investment in the machinery, the equipment that women used to keep house, to preserve food, to raise gardens and poultry, which was considered women's work, and to process dairy products, which was also women's work. And so women in this survey, when they were asked, why do you think this is the case, they attributed this lack of equal investment in equipment for women as men's failure to recognize the difficulty and the economic importance of women's work. One Kansas woman, for instance, claimed that men frequently located water wells for the convenience of their livestock rather than for their wives. Uh, the result was that women often had to haul water, you know, in big buckets uh, from 100 to 200 yards from the barnyard into their homes. Another Kansas woman described the difficulty of farm women's work and their lack of modern plumbing equipment and describe male's indifference to this situation in very dramatic language. So I will attempt to read this language a little bit dramatically. Oh, the weary arms that pump water, carry it down steps, around the corner, up two steps, through two doors, giving the pail a final hoist to a high shelf, table, or sink. Then the water must be carried out. Few men can see a slop pail. In other words, men don't want to carry the dirty water out. The same arms, the women's arms, carry a larger pail, its weight enhanced with floating peelings and kitchen refuse, carry it down the same steps around the corner, and four rods through mud to the pig pen, handily arranged for a lift over a stock fence. You know, insult to injury. Once you've hauled all that dirty water back out and you're going to slop the pigs with it, your husband has constructed a high fence that you then have to, you know, get up on your tiptoes and dump the bucket over that fence. So, uh, according to most women, including Midwestern women, and specifically the Plains women in the Midwest that I'm focusing on in my comments today, these women, in responding to Secretary Houston's survey, said their lack of modern equipment served as a highly visible and a very concrete measure of the extent to which men disregarded the significance of women's work. So the women uh, tell Secretary Houston that in asking for things like modern uh, plumbing equipment and other types of machinery, they are asking that the effort they put into their work on the farm be better recognized by a fairer investment in the equipment they used. Two years after Secretary Houston sent out this survey to the nation's farm women, a Nebraska woman, a woman named Minnie B. Davis, wrote one-on-one -on -one to Secretary Houston and commented on the published results of the 1913 survey. And at this point in her life, this is 1915, uh, she's still living in a sod house. Minnie B. Davis, we think of that as a 19th century phenomenon out on the Great Plains. That isn't quite true. This is a woman. Uh, Mrs. Schoenfeld, living in Sheridan County, Kansas, uh, Sheridan County named, I'll get a little Ohio history into this, named after General Sheridan, who was an Ohioan. Uh, I don't want Ohio to feel excluded since they aren't part of the book, so to try to draw in my Ohio audience. We'll say this is my nod to Ohio. Uh, Sheridan County, Kansas, 1939, the Schoenfelds are still living in a sod house. So this is not just a homesteading 19th century phenomenon. Yes, I am talking to an Ohio audience. Larry, if this were Kansas, right, everyone would know what a sod house is. Okay, okay, all right. So uh, yeah, another professor here shares my Kansas roots. These, it was blocks of the sod, plowed up like bricks, and the houses we're made of dirt. Have you ever read Little House on the Prairie or any of these uh, fictional accounts, or factual accounts for that matter, of life in the 19th century in the Great Plains? Uh, the scholar, the, the primary scholar of the Great Plains experience, the inventor of the field of Great Plains study, Walter Prescott Webb said, uh, society, culture, sorry, there's sociologists here, culture. Uh, I need to use my terms carefully. Culture, human culture, is based on three elements. Water, this was his argument, water, wood, and soil. 
and the Great Plains only had one of those. Soil, okay? Water, as I've already indicated, is hard to come by. Um, limited supply of water out on the Great Plains. Um, it is barren land without trees, except near you know, some of the creeks and rivers. <coughs> and so you use what you have, which in this case is dirt. So we'll just call it dirt. <laughs> uh, bricks made of dirt. And this house and the house that Minnie B. Davis is living in in 1915 are made of sod bricks. And they're, they've whitewashed you know, the inside of the walls. And uh, as I said, this is 1939. That, to illustrate how recent that is in human history, my mom was 10 years old in 1939. You know, there are people around who remember 1939. And yet, these folks, the Schoenfelds, were still living a life that was very close to a 19th century life. Living in a sod house, they tried to spiff it up a little bit. And Mrs. Schoenfeld, though, is proud of the one piece of modern manufactured domestic equipment she has, which is this pressure cooker. So when the photographer, Russell Lee, who was working for, uh, you all know what the New Deal was? Okay. Uh, he was working for a New Deal agency, the Farm Security Administration, and he was working for a unit of photographers that uh, were very famous and whose work is still widely seen today. Uh, worked for a man named Roy Stryker who said, if we're going to sell New Deal programs to the American people, we need to go out there and take pictures of what rural life is really like. If we want middle class people in cities to support the Farm Security Administration, which was trying to improve uh, the lives of farmers fairly low down on the socioeconomic scale. If we want middle class America to rally around our agency, we have to show them how rural people are really living. So Russell Lee, one of the photographers working for Roy Stryker in the FSA, asked the Schoenfelds uh, to pose for some pictures here in their sod house. And Mrs. Schoenfeld says, I want to show off my pressure cooker. So I think this is good visual evidence how proud women were of their labor. In this case, she'll use this to can meat. She'll use this to can fruits and vegetables from her garden. She uses the pressure cooker in her work canning. And this is a very important part of farm women's work at this time. And so she's going to show off this piece of, this piece of equipment that represents her part of the farm economy. Even in these rather humble surroundings, um, she does have this one piece of modern equipment, so I think it is quite useful to my arguments here this morning that she chooses to pose with this piece of equipment. So anyway, her counterpart, living in Nebraska about 20 years earlier, Minnie Davis, writes directly to Secretary of Agriculture Houston, and she says, I've read the published results of that survey you did a couple of years ago, and here's what I want to tell you about my life. She's living in a sod house. She's 30 miles from the nearest railroad, and this would be typical at the, in the um, sparsely populated plain states where farms were very far from each other, and very far, oftentimes, from the nearest uh, railroad stop or the nearest town. She's raising a son, a daughter. She's carried for a, caring for a hired man. And this is something that farm women of this era complained about a lot. I have enough trouble taking care of my own uh, family. And then my husband hires. They were usually described as these rough hired men uh, who have bad habits. And that might not be a good influence on my children, but I still have to wash their clothes and I have to feed them. Um, so she mentions taking care of this hired man, cooking, cleaning, sewing, gardening, and periodically working out in the ca cash crop fields, which was quite typical uh, that women out here in the Midwest during this period took a turn in the farm fields. It wasn't usually their daily kind of labor, but they did work at least occasionally in the cash crop fields. So she says this very plainly to Secretary Houston. She says, what these women are telling you when they say, maybe I want a pressure cooker, maybe I want a gasoline-powered washing machine, uh, maybe I want water piped into the house. She says, and this is a direct quotation from her, 
what you heard from women all over the country tell the story, not complaint of work or really lack of conveniences, but of unequal status. She said in asking for vacuum cleaners, for bathtubs, women are really asking for greater power and influence within the farm family and the rural community. And she goes on to say this, I do not want to leave any work undone. None of the work that I now do, but I have a very large share in making our land what it is, and I have a right to be something more than a drudge. And that is what women are when they do nothing but work, work, work from year's end to year's end. The greatest thing for the improvement of farm life is the elevation of women to an equal status. So in saying, I want my pressure cooker, they're saying, I want greater recognition of the important work I do, and that my work is just as important to making the farm a success as my husband's. Well, a few years later, 1921, some other Nebraskans uh, wrote what they called a Declaration of Independence. This was a group of women in 1921, and they published this in uh, the periodical The Nation. In this Declaration of Independence, they said they wanted a power washing machine in the house for every tractor purchased for the farm. They wanted a bathtub in the house for every binder on the farm. And Larry, I may have to define a binder for this crowd, too. Uh, as the, um, the grains are harvested, then the binder will bind them into bundles that can be stacked up and dried out in the field. Um, they want running water in the kitchen for every riding plow in the fields. They want a kerosene cook stove for every motor truck, a fireless cooker for every new mowing machine. And this, I think, is the real clincher and a share of the farm income for themselves. So when this Declaration of Independence by these Nebraska farm women was published in the nation in 1921, it was under the headline, Feminism on the Farm. And the women who had signed on to this document said they would not rest until 100% of their number had achieved economic justice and technological parity with men. So, um, I, as I think these kinds of comments make very clear, women's desire for mechanized equipment went well beyond uh, the idea of easing their daily labor. In calling for this kind of improved equipment and investment in that equipment, they were criticizing male behavior. They were demanding greater recognition of women's work. They were calling for a share of the farm income. And they were also requesting greater decision-making power within the farm family. So this desire for improved equipment was more than a means to ease their work and become better homemakers. <coughs> you know, if I had a, a vacuum cleaner, maybe I could keep a cleaner house. It's more than that. Women knew the importance of their work to the farm family economy, and they wanted to continue to be major players in that economy in a productive way. They're not asking to be homemaker consumers. They're saying, if we have the kind of equipment we desire, that will show our equal status, that will recognize that we are equal partners in farm production. Much of this book is about the gulf between what farm women want and what the USDA wants for them, the US Department of Agriculture. Most members of the USDA have a different agenda at this time. Instead, they want farm women to become more like urban homemakers. And they see, uh, most officials in the USDA, they see acquisition of modern equipment in a different light. They want farm life uh, to follow an urban industrial model. They want farm men to start thinking of themselves as businessmen, as farm businessmen. And women should become full-time homemakers. Um, a man named C.B. Smith, who's the chief of the USDA's Office of Cooperative Extension Work, which was uh, that arm of the USDA that uh, put people out in the fields and in the local county seats and communities to teach farm people new uh, ways of working and, and supposedly more efficient means of produ production, both in the fields and in the household. Uh, this 
man, C.B. Smith, who heads up the Office of Cooperative Extension Work, gives voice to what the USDA agenda is and uh, how he and most members of the USDA see appropriate gender roles in the 1920s. Now, notice how close this sounds to, well, an episode of Mad Men, if any of you watched that uh, series. The husband goes out and works all day and comes home to the loving homemaker who's created this beautiful place of refuge for him. This idea of farm homes should look more like urban homes. When the farmer returns weary from the field at night to a modest, attractive home, it makes him feel that the day's work has not been in vain. But to have such a home, to sit down to the evening meal with joy on every face, demands that mother must have every labor-saving convenience. Home life in the country will never reach its highest ideals until farm women have more of the things that they really desire. So this official, this USDA official, is only reading at the surface level. Oh, they say they want washing machines, vacuum cleaners, bathtubs. That's really what they want. That's, that's the end goal. I want this piece of equipment. So they can have nicer, spiffier homes that can be more attractive havens in a heartless world. But no. The women themselves are saying, we want these things because they're good to have, but there's a lot more behind our request for this kind of equipment. There are larger demands behind these kinds of requests. So at the time C.B. Smith makes these comments that the home must have all of these uh, newfangled uh, modern pieces of equipment because we need to have farm homes look more like urban middle class homes, he seems to be ignoring the fact that women are very, very centrally still involved in farm production. At the time Smith makes these comments in the 1920s, in the Midwest, 67% of farm women tend gardens, 89% raise poultry, 45% milk cows, 66% made butter, 33% sold butter, 22% Perform field work, raising cash crops like wheat, uh, corn, and other grains. 22% uh, perform field work for an average 4.9 weeks a year. 33% did the bookkeeping for their farms. And in addition, they did perform numerous monotonous housekeeping chores. 79% cleaned and cared for kerosene and lamps on a daily basis. And when I was doing research for this book and was interviewing elderly um, farm women about their experiences uh, earlier in the 20th century. They said, you know, this was one reason we really wanted electric power in our homes, was not to run the washing machines, not to run the dishwashers, not to run eventually the television sets or the trash compactors uh, or microwave ovens that we eventually had. It was every day we had to clean those kerosene lamps. The globes on the lamps would get all sooty. We'd have to clean them room to room. We got really tired of that task. So 79% of Midwestern farm women are cleaning and caring for kerosene lamps on a daily basis. 68% are hauling water. They don't have water pumped into their own homes from an average distance of 41 feet. 97% are baking bread at least once or twice a week. And 97% did household laundry once or twice a week. And they are doing all of this kind of labor uh, largely without uh, modern domestic equipment. This will show you uh, in, again, the Midwestern states that still had a predominantly agricultural economy during this period. So it's exclusive of Michigan and Ohio. Uh, we have very small percentages of households that have electric lights or have running water. We see an uptick uh, in the decade between 1920 and 1930, uh, but even as late as 1930, most Midwestern farm homes don't have this kind of uh, modern technology within their own homes. The survey findings um, that 
or from this period, show that as housekeepers and farm producers, Midwestern women were working an average of 13.2 hours a day in the summer. Those are pretty long days. That goes well beyond the proverbial eight-hour day, work day, and they were working 10.5 hours in the winter. And in a 1923 survey, uh, again, the complaint is their chief criticism of farm life is their lack of modern conveniences and their overwork. Now, uh, something we need to keep in mind is uh, we say the Great Depression begins with the stock market crash of 1929. Well, that's true if we are just looking at the urban economy. Uh, we already see a depression conditions in rural America beginning after World War I. So throughout the 20s and the 30s, rural America is in a Great Depression. And we see with um, this situation that, as presented here, in those desperate economic conditions that are gripping rural America in the 20s and the 30s, there are only going to be modest gains in acquiring uh, more of the kind of uh, equipment and uh, power sources that women desire. In contrast, uh, we see a pretty significant rise in uh, the communication and transportation technology. Of course, tractors uh, will advance men's work out in the farm fields. Uh, automobiles also are primarily seen as male machines at this time and are seen as necessary uh, to transport um, crops into town, uh, to do errands into town to pick up farm equipment. Uh, telephones are maybe something you could look at the entire farm family using, but they were particularly important for men to check uh, what the local farm market prices were, this kind of thing. So if we look at telephones and automobiles, we might say all members of the farm family could periodically take advantage of these pieces of equipment, uh, but not uh, necessarily so, because this was very much a patriarchal farm family situation, and if dad wanted to use the car or truck, it was more likely to be a truck on the farm, or if dad needed to use the telephone, his work took priority. And certainly dad and older sons were the ones primarily benefiting from uh, gasoline-powered tractors. So during this same... Uh, agricultural depression period, we do see significant gains in the kind of equipment that is primarily used by men and might have uh, the side effect of benefiting other members of the family as well with the automobile and the telephone. Um, but women during the agricultural depression are giving their uh, part of the farm economy uh, a real boost. Again, in my own oral history research, one woman after another would say, it was my butter and eggs money that saved us during the Depression. The price that men could get for cash crops, which were largely their uh, realm of production, and large livestock, uh, those weren't great prices during this time period that is illustrated up here, uh, this 1920-1930 period, and then 1930-1940 to 1940 is the entire nation, not just the agricultural sector that goes into depression. But my eggs, I could always get something for my eggs. I could always get something for my butter. And if I didn't get cash directly, I could barter those items. I could take them to town and trade them, say, for a pound of sugar. So again and again, Farm women say, you know, it was my work that brought in very needed money and uh, consumer products into our household. And even many farm men and farm sons that I interviewed said the same thing. Oh, if it hadn't been for mom, I don't know if we had made it through the Great Depression. Well, 
we see the people who are promoting improvement of household technology, we see their recognition here during the agricultural depression that, oh, yeah, we might be able to convince farm families to invest better in so-called women's equipment if we catch on. Oh, women are farm producers too. And especially the washing machine manufacturers were very good with this kind of thing. Um, the uh, a magazine that Nebraska farm families frequently read with the very, uh, I think, self-explanatory title, Nebraska Farmer. Uh, in the Nebraska Farmer, there was an ad for a Maytag washing machine. Now, washing machines could be run by gas motors or if you had electrical power run by electricity. And uh, the Maytag company advertised both models, but particularly put a lot of emphasis on the gasoline-powered model. And in a Nebraska uh, farmer advertisement for Maytag, there was this headline, hours saved by Maytag make money for the farm wife. And the picture illustrating that ad was the woman out feeding her chickens. Oh, if I'm not at the scrub board, and instead my motorized Maytag is washing the clothes, I can spend more time as a farm producer. And this was um, a common theme in advertising of this era. Now, one of the New Deal innovations was, rural, was the Rural Electric Administration, and, or the REA. And the REA was a project that was set up to electrify the nation's farm homes and barns and other parts of the farm uh, where electrical equipment might be used. Um, some homes already had home generators, but these uh, were gasoline powered usually and didn't run 24 hours a day, of course. And the idea behind the REA, which is established in 1935, is we will get more reliable, high-wire electricity to the nation's farm households. But there was a catch. You had to have, per every mile, three farms signing on to the high-line electricity. Okay? So per every square mile, three farms. That was easier in some parts of the country than in other parts of the country, especially out on the Great Plains. You're not going to have farms that are that close to one another. Sparsely settled region. And because of its dry environment, uh, you needed a lot more land to successfully farm. You needed a lot of land to farm dry land crops that didn't need a lot of water, particularly wheat. So even with the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration. Uh, even once it comes into play in 1935, we still see most Midwestern Great Plains farms don't have reliable high-line electricity or even their own gasoline-powered electrical plants. By 1940, five years after the REA has been established, only 11% of Kansas farm families have electricity. 13% of farm families in Nebraska, only 2% of North Dakota farm families have electricity, and 4% of South Dakota families have electricity. But there were uh, some types of equipment, obviously, uh, still going to be a lack of high-line electrical-powered equipment in households, but what about those households that had home generators or used battery-powered equipment. So there's one piece of modern technology uh, that is established in 1920 that you will find in a lot of farm homes, even those that aren't uh, uh, electrified yet. And again, our Farm Security Administration photographers uh, took pictures of what I call the family altar, uh, the radio. Most radios on farms were battery-powered. And so farm families, uh, even if they had nothing else, had radios. Uh, by 1930, 
for instance, there was one Midwestern state, Iowa, where more rural people than urban people had radios. Because again, the radio can be justified as agricultural production equipment. I've got to hear the farm market reports from Chicago. Let's turn on the radio. I want to hear the weather report. Should I bring in the crop today? Is it going to be sunny all day? Or should I risk that there might be a hailstorm tomorrow? And of course, it's again a piece of equipment that dad might get first crack at to hear the farm reports or the weather reports. But ultimately, all family members can use, uh, listen to music programming, educational programming, um, entertainment. Believe it or not, kids, there was a time when you didn't watch sitcoms online. Uh, you listen to them on the radio. Uh, I, I think my students, just my students, maybe not all students, when I talk about listening to radio, that, you know, oh, you mean you just sit for hours and laugh? at a program on the radio? How did you know when to laugh? How did you know when the people were doing funny things? Well, you listened, and they said funny things. Uh, and you listened to the sound effects. And so uh, farm families were beginning to be tied in to urban culture more than ever through the radio. And we're beginning to hear more about urban standard of life. I interviewed one woman in Nebraska who said, we really didn't know how to dance. We just did square dancing and this kind of thing until we started hearing the jazz music from New York or Chicago, and then we realized, oh, you know, you can't square dance to that. And we wanted to learn, you know, how to do more modern dancing. Uh, kids would listen to programs about children living in places like California or New York or, um, you know, Philadelphia, Baltimore, wherever, and say, oh, well, those kids have a, a bicycle. Those kids have a, a, a newspaper route. Those kids are living a different kind of life than I'm living here on the farm. Um, there, there began to be a greater curiosity about how the rest of America is living that's driven to a great extent by radio programming, which again builds up more of a desire, hey, we need to have certain objects in our house or pieces of equipment uh, or consumer items that people elsewhere in the nation have. And anyway, this is a picture of a North Dakota family. Uh, this is 1937. The photographer, again, is Russell Lee, one of the Farm Security Administration photographers. Uh, a couple listening to the radio uh, in the evening. The man's reading something. The wife seems to be doing some mending. Uh, so a, a piece of equipment that could be justified as an appropriate expense for farm production for the reasons I said, but as a byproduct, other members of the family could use it and enjoy it as well. During World War II, um, we go into an entirely war-based economy. It's not a consumer economy. Um, and so any type of uh, production, including automobile production, production of, of home appliances like washing machines, that's put on hold. And priority is given to manufacture of, of uh, items for the war effort. At the same time, the nation's farmers are told, you have to produce more and more and more and more. You have to feed our service persons here at home and overseas. You have to s feed our civilian population. You have to feed our lend-lease partners, uh, our allies. You have to feed the people of Britain. You have to fe feed the people of the Soviet Union. We also had some lend-lease partners in South America. We became, President Roosevelt said, we were the arsenal of democracy during World War II. We're doing all the manufacturing for our allies in this great war machine that we're building to fight fascism. Uh, but we also became the breadbasket of democracy. So at a time when there aren't new tractors being made, there aren't new farm trucks being made, instead planes and tanks and ships are being made, uh, the farm families of America are told produce more and more and more and more. And so for the first time, uh, we see a push is on to let farm women as well as men run expensive field equipment. Now, this happens for two reasons. One is, well, if American industry is supposed to be running 24 hours a day during the war, uh, the American farm needs to be doing close to that as well if we're going to step up our production rate. And so 
uh, you know, dad may do his eight hours on the tractor and then it's someone else's turn. That might be the wife, that might be the daughter. Less likely to be the son, for what obvious reason? They're in the military. And even though there were farm deferments, um, not, most young farm men um, were not taking advantage of those deferments. And some local draft boards weren't cooperating with the idea that young farm men should be deferred from the military to serve on the farm war front uh, because our military machine just needed so much manpower, frankly. Uh, and also, in a paper I just gave a couple of weeks ago at another university, um, the soldier, the sailor, the marine was the glamour figure for young men at this time. Uh, it was the most highly prized form of young masculinity. And being a, a farm boy didn't have the same kind of glamour and also didn't always um, make a young man feel that he uh, was serving as noble a purpose as he might be if he were in uniform. So frankly, labor shortage, lack of young men on the farms made farm families more convinced, well, we don't like to think of this as women's work, but let's encourage some of the female family members to start using the tractors. And particularly because of this investment in expensive farm equipment, a lot of farm families didn't want strangers using those tractors either. They didn't want the farm kid from down the road, even though he's a boy, uh, to come use that tractor, maybe. Instead, I'll have my daughter use the tractor because she understands she'll get in big trouble from me if she breaks something on that tractor. And she supposedly will understand that this was a real sacrifice uh, to purchase this tractor in the first place and to keep it in good condition. So we have, uh, again, out on the Great Plains uh, Midwestern states, um, and I'm talking here specifically about the wheat belt, we see women's use of agricultural equipment, like the woman here you know, driving a tractor on the cover of my book. Uh, we see this jump pretty dramatically. Um, in 1941, and remember, the US isn't in the war until the very end of 1941. So 1941's our last, for all practical purposes, year of peace during the World War II era. In 1941, only 8% of Kansas women used uh, mechanized field equipment on a regular basis. By 1942, the first full year of American involvement in the war, 26%, over a quarter of Kansas farm women are using mechanized farm equipment. In North Dakota, 1941, only 5% of farm women are using mechanized field equipment. By 42, it's 25%. South Dakota, only 8% of farm women using mechanized field equipment. By 1942, 30%. So at the end of the war, there was a great deal of praise for women's field work and the role they had played in increasing farm production during the war crisis. But now the USDA, which has praised and encouraged this kind of work during the war, says, well, no, but now, now, the agricultural depression is over, the war is over, Let's get back to that project we've been urging for several decades now, be more like urban homemakers. And we do see that women's farm production efforts decline after World War II. You see, uh, the last full year of the war, our statistics, how many women are involved in gardening, how it drops only five years later. Uh, Daring statistics, you see the same thing, 1939, um, how they drop pretty noticeably, if not dramatically in some instances, by 1949. Same thing with women butchering and canning their own meat. What's going on here? Well, there's no longer the uh, pressure to uh, produce so much at home to survive economic hard times. There's no longer uh, the pressure to produce at home to fill in the gap uh, during wartime when you know it's going to be difficult to purchase food for the family because of wartime food rationing. So we'll 
produce more of our own. That pressure's off. Now, there's still uh, the argument that we need to outproduce, American farms need to outproduce our new enemy, the Soviet Union, during the Cold War era. But farmers, those who are still in the business of farming, because we also see a drop off in the number of farms after World War II, uh, farmers are more prosperous than they've been in quite some time. And you have a full labor force, you know, the men are back from the military. We don't need women to be involved in uh, farm production as much as we have in, in an earlier era. But we still want women to be involved in the economy of the farm. So what happens is that women shift a little bit. They are still involved in being farm producers, but sort of like Rosie the Riveter in American industry during World War II, when women are given an opportunity to do new kind of work during the war, many of them want to continue to do that kind of work after the war. And so there were some women who got a taste of uh, cash crop production during the war and a taste of working with the large livestock, and they wanted to continue to do that. Uh, and those who don't actively engage in those kind of activities uh, realize that they need to make some kind of economic contribution to the farm because farming is becoming uh, a more capital-intensive enterprise. Now that the war is over and we're back to a consumer-oriented economy and we're making new farm equipment and farm <coughs> income is up for those families that have survived the Depression era, uh, we want to buy more of this farm equipment. And we need maybe more cash coming in to pay for that kind of equipment. In other words, farming is becoming less labor intensive and is becoming more capital intensive. And so uh, we have two things going on. Women continue to be very active players in the farm economy uh, by virtue of, in some households, expanding their work into work with livestock and cash crops, or working on off-farm jobs, women, and taking that money and reinvesting it in the farm. So I'm going to share a few more statistics with you. Um, in 1958, 77% of farm women in the Midwest said they at least occasionally operated farm machinery and worked with large livestock. A couple years later, in 1960, 24% of Midwestern farm women said they worked in the field on a regular basis. It wasn't just occasional, it was on a regular basis. Uh, more and more farms are able to electrify because the REA changes its demand that there be three farms per square mile. And uh, so even far-flung Great Plains farms are becoming uh, electrified. So I'll just share a few more statistics here. Um, so we see here throughout the Midwestern farm states, uh, the vast majority will now be electrified. Uh, the REA also had uh, loans to farmers to, per once they electrified the farms, to purchase uh, electric powered equipment. And so along with these farms being electrified, uh, they are gaining more of the electric powered uh, equipment for inside the house. We see the growth of telephone use, uh, and of course tractors uh, are the vast, vast majority of, of farmers own tractors. Now, you're, the one state, in, and I said I was mainly going to focus on the Midwestern Plains states, but the one state that seems an anomaly here in all these statistics is Missouri, but you have to recognize that Missouri, uh, as a farm economy, was sort of half Southern and half Midwestern, so it, it um, followed patterns in the southern half of that state that were much more in line with Arkansas, Alabama, you know, cotton growing regions of the country, for instance. Um, anyway, but if we look at the rest of the Midwest, which is predominantly livestock and grain farming, we see a different story here. Okay, so what did women think about this uh, reorientation of, of their work? One observer noted in 1960, when modern appliances were first introduced, it looked like an end to the old adage, women's work is never done. But along with the time savers inside, like electric powered washing machines, electric powered automatic dryers, which is a new post-World War II invention, 
um, uh, the electric range, uh, the electric garbage disposal. Along with all of that uh, came the increased use of machinery outside, and women were right back where they started. So women are still working a lot on farms, but more so maybe outside, because they do now have more time for their chickens. Uh, the equipment's in there, running the clothes through the dryer. Oh, I don't have to go hang the clothes on the line. I can be out there feeding the chickens, or more likely now after World War II, driving the tractor. 46% of Midwestern farm women said they preferred field work over housework. 32% said they had no strong preference, and only 22% they performed field work because, quote, it had to be done. Uh, so we see many women much prefer working in the field to being in the household, and the modernization of the household gives them more time and energy to be field workers. Uh, and like women of an earlier era, many of these women express pride in their role as farm producers. As one post-World War II woman said of her farm labor, it makes me feel real important. So, continued investment in farm machinery and household devices and other expenses in the post-war era um, meant that an increased number of farm women also contributed to the farm family economy by holding off farm jobs, as I mentioned a moment ago. So they're uh, taking uh, the automobile and using it for their own purposes, maybe working in town as a school teacher, as a store clerk, uh, and bringing cash into the household in ways that they hadn't before, taking advantage, yes, of dependable automobiles, improved rural roads. Um, as an observer said, the labor-saving devices which the farm wife now shares with her city cousin, together with better roads and more dependable automobiles, make it possible today for farm women to hold part-time jobs. With the large amount of capital required to start farming today, the wife's income may be a welcome addition to farm families. And rural sociologists, like Professor Terman, although a couple of generations <laughs> before her time, uh, said that this translated into greater decision-making power for farm women. One post-war poll showed that 82% of farm families showed husbands and wives sharing equally in decisions regarding the purchase of home appliances. So you don't have that situation that women were complaining about in that 1913 survey saying, there's not a fair investment. I don't have a choice. He says, we're going to buy the tractor. I can't buy a gasoline-powered washing machine. No. The vast majority of Midwestern farm households, the husbands and wives, are making decisions together about what we purchase, including for the home. And one woman said, I feel that I help in producing the income, and I have a right to help in spending it. So uh, to close my comments, I want to... Uh, make reference to a couple of oral histories I did. Um, I'll just read my clever conclusion here. Uh, for farm women who had access to modern domestic equipment, acquisition of these devices did not automatically translate into full-time homemaking, which is what the USDA had thought would be the case. In the post-war era, women continued to be direct contributors to the farm family economy, although the type of work they performed, mechanized field work and work for pay off the farm using the automobile, was more appropriate to the capital intensive agriculture of 1960 than the labor intensive agriculture of 1910. Um, I talked to women of two generations of one Nebraska family. Esther Hardy, the, this is a family that lives out in western Nebraska had married during the World War I era, and life on the farm for her meant no modern plumbing, no electrical equipment, caring for large numbers of hired men, and milking cows by hand. For her daughter-in-law, Jean Hardy, who married in 1959, life on the farm meant a fully modernized farm home, frequent use of the automobile to go into town for farm equipment parts and other errands, uh, and operating expensive field equipment. In fact, she said her biggest worry was being modernized because every time she went to use the field equipment, she was so worried that she might damage it somehow. Hey, we 
paid a lot of money for this piece of equipment. I sure hope I don't break it. And she said, this was a concern my mother-in-law never had. So in summarizing the difference in their lives, Jean Hardy, the younger woman, believed that her mother-in-law's life had been characterized by greater physical labor, while her own was dominated by greater mental stress that was associated with the large financial investment to maintain a farm in the post-war era. Neither of these women, however, Esther, the older woman, or Jean, the younger woman, had seen her activities limited to homemaking. Esther had raised poultry, canned vegetables, cared for hired men. Jean operated farm equipment, drove to town for machinery parts. So both, although in different ways, participated directly in farm production as well as performing services that supported men's work with the large livestock and the cash crops. So uh, bottom line, adoption of modern household and farm equipment had not relegated women to the full-time homemaking role that the USDA had envisioned for them, but instead they continued to play an important role on the post-war farm, just as they had uh, throughout the history of American agriculture. Um, time for some questions. Um, I'm undeserving uh, of that round of applause. Yes? Um, if you go back a couple of slides to the uh, percentage of farm families uh, owning technology, um, it looks like automo yeah, that one. automobiles and tractors went up in pretty much every state. Mm -hmm. For some reason, telephones were either declining or flatlining. Um, I was just wondering, is there an explanation? Yeah. That again, uh, the automobiles and the tractors, the farms have become much more dependent on those economically, and telephones were seen as something that in depression conditions we can do without. We can go back to our earlier form of communication, uh, you know, face to face, letter writing, that kind of thing. So we saw this in urban homes too during the depression, that telephone use was uh, one modern convenience that was uh, many families made the decision, we can do without that. There are other things we can't do without, but the telephone will cut back on that expense. Other questions? Larry. It's kind of interesting that you know, the USDA and the kind of land grant yeah. college system yes. didn't keep up with this. I mean, if you look at you know how colleges of agriculture were organized in the 50s and 60s, it was still very uh, you know kind of gendered in terms of yes. their expectations for what you know uh, rural women would yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. And, and and property extension too. Yes. There was not very much outreach to women who were yeah. doing this kind of work, but you know property extension had home demonstration units right. where they would uh, you know the emphasis was. Uh, making households, you know, like urban. Houses. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's quite. A, yeah, quite as I a, said, um, this book and and Rachel was so kind not to say how long ago I wrote this book. It was a while ago. Uh, I think one reason um, it's still on some course reading list anyway is because I I uh, I wrote this before most of you were were born, 1993 is the copyright date on this book, um, is because, uh, interestingly enough, I seem to be the first person who found that there was such a disconnect between what farm women were really doing, what they really wanted, and what the uh, land-grant institutions and the extension system were telling them to do. And I could backtrack and, and go into a long discussion of that. I don't have the time. But I think one of the problems is, uh, in the progressive era, the rural arm of US progressivism was the country life movement. And it was too much dominated by people who might have come originally from a rural background, but by the time that they are advising the first President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, they are all urban bureaucrats. And so they see things, uh, I, my argument is, through too much of an urban lens and too much, uh, they are removed from their, their boyhood, this is all male, experiences on the farm or even their young adulthoods on the farm and are living pretty much, we talked today about each of us being in our own bubbles and I think 
that that was uh, uh, many of the policymakers were, you know, in Washington D.C. and and were physically removed from life in the countryside. And they, when they saw that the standard of living, on the surface anyway, may not look as good as their urban middle class life, especially this issue over and over again about plumbing. Oh, they don't have plumbing in the house. Uh, one woman, one farm woman said, uh, you, but you can't go to town in a bathtub. I'd rather have the car. <laughs> I'd rather have the farm truck to go you know, visit the town and maybe go to some of those jazz bands in person that I'm hearing on the radio. Uh, you can't take modern plumbing and go, go to town. So I think there was not enough on the ground um, questioning of what farm people really wanted, and especially farm women. Uh, David Houston tried it with that 1913 survey, the Secretary of Agriculture at that time. Uh, but I, I think, like Minnie Davis said, you're, you're misinterpreting some of, of the results you're getting. That we might be saying, yeah, we would like this equipment, but we don't want to give up our role as farm producers and be like the urban housewives. And the young woman here, did you have a question? Um, Another question? Yeah. So you were saying that um, the people, the women were asking for the, um, the like recognized household helpers. They were like, oh, they, they want to be like housewives or something. But the women were like, no, we want equal, um, like equality with men or whatever. So like why? Were the people listening to the women like making that judgment on them? Was it just like sexism, or were they like, "That's how you should be"? Or <laughs> yeah, I think that it was uh, many of those demands. Not many Davis, but um, those that occur later in the twenties and thirties. I think part of what's going on there is you don't ha any longer have a high-profile, organized feminist movement behind them. Once uh, first wave feminism had achieved the right to vote, uh, it's not that feminism disbanded, but you no longer had a unified movement behind one central issue. And so women who had been working in the suffrage campaign went off into a variety of other interests. For many of the uh, rural feminists, it was about infant and maternal health. And they pushed something called the Shepherd Towner Act which was um, Congress did indeed pass. And it was in existence in the 1920s. It was government-sponsored nurses' visits and health care to try to improve uh, infant and, and maternal mortality rates in rural America. Uh, ultimately, by the time we get to the end of the 1920s, Congress uh, is, no longer wants to fund that project. Um, but. I think it would have made a difference had, for instance, women who were concerned about, we want to improve our role as farm producers, and women who said, we want to, in, uh, we want to improve rural maternal and infant health, and women over here who said, oh, no, I want to make sure that uh, we have... Um, better rural education. It was like rural feminists had, had, had broken off into a variety of interest groups. And had they come together as an organized movement and said, here's our list of priorities, and, and we will all agree on this, and we will have a unified front, they would have been better at getting across a message. Bottom line, what we all want as farm women is greater equality within the farm household and say so. And you just didn't have, when Minnie B. Davis writes that letter to Secretary Houston in 1915, there is still a vibrant, organized, first wave feminist movement. And she is very active in the suffrage movement. And she can talk, I just gave you some excerpts of her letter, she can talk in terms of, you know, and once we get the vote, this, you know, these are the things that farm women will demand with that vote. So I would say that's a good lesson um, in how we sometimes um, we sometimes lose momentum when we think we've achieved um, a goal. 
and it might not be for lack of trying or lack of will, but lack of, of unity. Um, once, once a major goal is reached, don't all run away. Uh, let's think, what is the logical second step? And rural and urban, I would argue, feminists were not doing that after, after the achievement of the 19th Amendment, not until, again, in the 1960s with the second wave movement. Other questions? All right, thank you very much. Good questions. <laughs>